Welcome to the Westport Library. Today's program will begin momentarily. Supported by Verso Studios. Created locally and shared with the world. Hello, everybody. Thank you all for being with us uh, at the Westport Library. And welcome to the kickoff of our four-day Twilight Zone Symposium, hosted and conceived by Arlen Schumer. Now, before we start, yeah, a little bit. So my name is Alex Giannini. I'm the program director here at the library. Uh, we are right now in the home stretch of three weeks of some really fun and engaging programming. This past weekend, more than 50 authors from across genres were here to talk about their work, their process, and to share their stories. Writers of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, literary fiction, cartoonists, puppeteers, storytellers, all of them, joined us for our seventh annual StoryFest Literary Festival. Which leads us to this evening and to the ultimate storyteller, Rod Serling. Throughout our symposium, Arlen Schumer will introduce each episode or film that we are going to screen, and he'll weave in little known facts about the show and about Serling. Now, before we get to tonight's program, I wanna mention something very special. Some of you may know that we have the, West, uh, the Westport Bookshop right across the street, and we have uh, used and rare books there for sale. We have a very, very rare book currently for sale. It's a first edition of Patterns, and it is signed by Rod Serling. If anyone is interested in seeing this, just come see me. I will be here until... I'll <laughs> you don't know the price. So, <laughs> so come find me. Uh, I'll be here all weekend. And I'm happy to show it to you, and uh, we can, uh, Dick Lowenstein's here, so we can't haggle, there's a set price, but let's talk. Okay, so tonight, Arlen is going to talk about Westport in the Twilight Zone, and share insights about this amazing town's connection to one of the greatest and most influential television series of all time. We'll screen the all-time great episode, A Stop at Willoughby, and a bit later, Arlen will introduce you to the cult classic film, The Swimmer, starring Burt Lancaster. But now, I have the honor of introducing you to Arlen Schumer. Arlen has spent his life advocating for the things that he loves and has made it his mission to bring pop culture into the mainstream of recognition. As you'll see, Arlen's deep knowledge of his subject matter is surpassed only by his passion for it, as evidenced in his brand new and definitive book, The Five Themes of the Twilight Zone, which is debuting here tonight and for sale in the wing, and afterwards Arlen will sign copies. So, Please join me in welcoming up my friend, Arlen Schumer. Let me get my glasses on. This always happens. There we are. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for turning out tonight. And I just want to let you know how blessed and honored and lucky I am to be able to be presenting what's really a dream come true for me, to be able to present not only tonight, but for four days, three nights and one day. I owe it all to the Westport Library, to Bill Harmer, Alex Giannini, Travis, David, and everybody helping out tonight. So again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. I'm honored to be presenting for you. So without any further ado, are you excited as I am about the Twilight Zone? Here we go, folks. There is a fifth dimension beyond that which is known to man. It is a dimension as vast as space and as timeless as infinity. It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is the dimension of imagination. It is an area which we call the twilight zone. First of all, ladies and gentlemen, we're not talking about the TV show or movies, I'm sorry, Twilight, but I'm sure Stephanie Meyer got the idea to call her series Twilight. In fact, look at this article. It's actually about 
Twilight, but using the pun of the Twilight Zone name, which is a brand that everybody recognizes. That's what we're here to talk about tonight, folks. Why the Twilight Zone is the greatest series in TV history. Why the Twilight Zone puts today's TV sci-fi to shame with its time-bending twists and all-pervasive paranoia. New box set reveals Rod Serling's classic in a dimension of its own. Rod Serling, one of the greatest television icons of the 20th century, possessed with maybe the greatest, maybe the greatest broadcast voice of the 20th century. And even younger people know about Serling because of all the great actors that have impersonated him. He was animated on The Simpsons, on Family Guy. The great Al Hirschfeld did not just one, but two images of Serling. Serling was a TV star on the cover of TV Guide. Back in the early 60s, he was also a style icon. I tried to wear my best Rod Serling black and white outfit tonight in honor of him, but look, you can get a Rod Serling action figure. Yeah, I know, it could be a little bit kind of creepy, but hey, that's why he's Rod Serling. Rod Serling, articles like this, why the Twilight Zone still speaks to us. It's why the government gave him a stamp a couple years ago. It's why Serling is in the New... You know you've made it when you're in the New York Times crossword. In fact, the New York Times has used so many Twilight Zone puns when they're talking about politics. Yes, living in the Trump zone. We'll talk about this more on Friday night, tomorrow night. Look, even in the arts and leisure section, the Twilight Zone of home staging, comparing Twilight Zone episodes to theater uh, stage plays. And of course, how about movies and the influence on the Twilight Zone? Take, for instance, last year's latest installment of the Planet of the Apes franchise. But let's go back to the beginning, 1968. The first Planet of the Apes movie, look at the credits down below. The screenplay is by one Michael Wilson, and Rod Serling. Now, there's a whole backstory to the making of Planet of the Apes, but the original 1963 novel by the French writer Pierre Boulet, I think that's how you pronounce his name, was all about another planet in which apes control and lord it over humans. Now, if you remember Tim Burton's remake of about 20 years ago, he was more faithful to Boulet's book by setting it on another planet. But forget the remake. We all know why we love the original Planet of the Apes, one of the greatest movie endings of all time. But what if I told you it comes from, gee, Rod Serling co-wrote the screenplay. In 1960, eight years earlier, there was a Twilight Zone episode about a bunch of American astronauts that crash land on a desert planet. You can see five of them died in the crash landing, but three of them are left alive. One of them, of course, goes rogue and murders the other two. But before the last one dies, he scrawls in the sand, I leave it up to you, the letter X, uh, a lowercase t, anyway, like 10 little Indians, he's left. And he's climbing rocks and mountains looking for water. And at the end of the episode, what does he see? Signs of Reno, Nevada, they had crash landed back on Earth and didn't know it. He was trying to draw a telephone pole in the sand. Ladies and gentlemen, that's basically the ending to the Plan of the Apes where you realize you're on the earth the whole time. That's why I can find a meme like this on Facebook. But wouldn't you know it, that episode, it's based on a story by Madeline Champion. It turns out in the fall of 59, after Serling debuted the episode, he's at a cocktail party in L.A., and, you know, the space program, if you've seen the right stuff, the Mercury Astronauts, they had just debuted a year earlier. And Madeline Champion was there, and she posited, you know, I bet you if astronauts crash-landed in the Mojave Desert, they would think they were on another planet. Serling took $500 out from his wallet and paid the woman right there and gave her credit. Take 1972's The Stepford Wives, which we're going to show on Sunday. That's based on a 1972 Ira Levin novel. The movie was 1975. But what if I told you the basic idea for the Stepford Wives comes out of a 1964 episode called Number 12 Looks Just Like You, which we're going to screen with its original 1964 commercials on Sunday before Stepford Wives, partially filmed in Westport, by the way. The 1964 episode You Drive, about a car that comes to life. 
uh, paging Stephen King, paging Stephen King. In fact, in King's 1981 overview of the science fiction, fantasy, and horror fields called Dance Macabre, now, when I was a kid, I thought the word was macabre. <laughs> Too much Hebrew school, I think. Anyway, he wrote, The Twilight Zone is damn near immortal. Here for once was something completely new and different. And Serling, who finally answered H.P. Lovecraft, who showed a new direction. For me and those of my generation, the answer was like a thunderclap of revelation, opening a million entrancing possibilities. Take Steven Spielberg of Stephen King's generation. 1971, who's seen the TV movie Duel with Dennis Weaver about a man in a Dodge Valiant being chased by a Mack truck? Look at the screenplay by Richard Matheson, who wrote the second amount of Twilight Zone scripts after Serling. And directed by, this was his first movie, even though it was a 90-minute TV movie. Well, wouldn't you know it, a couple of years later, the producers of a certain movie looked at Duel and said, you know, if that director can make us feel this scared of a Mack truck, in which we never see the driver, by the way, I bet you he can do wonders with a mechanical shark. And that's why Spielberg got the job to direct Jaws. A couple years later, he co-directs Poltergeist with Toby Hooper, who did Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Remember, they're here, all about a dimensional portal in her bedroom wall. Well, Richard Matheson, who wrote Duel, wrote a 1962 episode called Little Girl Lost. And yeah, it's about a guy that loses his daughter in a dimensional gap in her bedroom wall. Now, Spielberg also made the 1983 movie, The Twilight Zone, and the less said about it, the better for a number of reasons. But I don't consider any remake of The Twilight Zone valid when they're shot in color, like the movie and every other remake of The Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone was a black and white concept, the middle ground between light and shadow. So now we jump to 1985, Woody Allen's The Purple Rose of Cairo with his then wife at the time, Mia Farrow, as a Depression-era housewife who only comes alive when she watches these 1930s Hollywood musicals. And by the end of the movie, she actually goes into the movie screen and metaphysically leaves her life behind. Twilight Zone, I think this was the third episode with the great Ida Lupino. Kind of Serling's take on Sunset Boulevard. She's an aging, silent movie actress. This is 1959, by the way. And she wishes she could go back to those great silent movies she was in when she was the ingenue. Well, wouldn't you know it, in the middle of the episode, she wishes hard enough and she winds up at the end of the episode in the film, just like Mia Farrow does 20 plus years later. 1985 also had one of the great, one of the great ventriloquist movies about the doll coming to life with a young Anthony Hopkins. Now, the ventriloquist coming to life motif, shall we say, goes back to the silent movies and the great Gabbo with Eric von Stroheim, who would later hook up, of course, with Marlene Dietrich. 1945, there's a British film called Dead of Night, which kind of like Twilight Zone was an anthology of four stories. One of them was about the doll coming to life. Then we flash forward to 1957 to Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and an episode, by the way, starring William Shatner, called The Glass Eye, all about a ventriloquist dummy coming to life. But none of these measure up to the Twilight Zone's episode called The Dummy, 1962, with the great Cliff Robertson and his sidekick, Willie. And at the end of the episode, spoiler alert, Robertson becomes the dummy, and the dummy becomes the human. <laughs> and if you've never seen this episode, run, don't walk, after this presentation, of course, and watch it. And if you still love Willie as much as the rest of us do, yes, you can get a Willie and, and uh, what was his name? Um, Etherson, I forget his first name. Anyway, the other great Twilight Zone doll coming to life is, of course, Living Doll with Talky Tina, who says, I'm Talky Tina, I'm going to kill you. Well, in 1960, Mattel came out with the first talking doll called Chatty Cathy. And basically, Charles Beaumont, the writer, based 
Talkie Tina on Chatty Cathy. The voice of Talkie Tina was the great June Foray. If Mel Blanc was the man of a thousand voices, or Barney Rubble and all the Warner Brothers cartoons, June Foray is the voice of Rocky and Bullwinkle and a million other characters. And she does the voice, the perfect voice of Talkie Tina. 30 years ago, I'm promoting my first book about the Twilight Zone, and I'm in LA doing a radio show. And the DJ goes, Arlen, uh, we have somebody special calling in for you. And who, what do I hear on the other end of the line? I'm talking Tina, and I'm going to kill you. They got June Foray to call in to my radio show. But anyway, Talkie Tina kind of transgendered years later into Chucky, of course, me even more malevolent than Talkie Tina. And he debuted in a 1988 film actually called Child's Play. And yes, if you want Talkie Tina in your living room or bedroom, you can get the Talkie Tina action figure. Other dolls coming to life in the Twilight Zone. I had a great discussion with about five characters in search of an exit, being somebody's favorite episode. It's one of my favorite. And what's it about? Five characters in a circular conundrum, don't know how they got there, don't know who they are. A ballerina dancer, a hobo, a bagpipe player, and of course at the end, spoiler alert, they are revealed to be dolls that have come to life. Gee, dolls that have come to life. Where has Hollywood <laughs> knocked off that idea? Okay, moving chronologically, 1990, one of the greatest horror films of the 20th century that we're going to be screening on Saturday night. Don't get that excited. <laughs> Who's seen Jacob's Ladder? If you haven't seen it, come Saturday night. But what can I tell you? It takes place during the Vietnam War era. It was based on a Twilight Zone episode from 1964, which in turn was based on an Ambrose Beer short story. And we're going to be talking about this episode Saturday night with an author of a book about the Twilight Zone who's also an expert on Mark Twain, Charles Dickens, and all the 19th century literary greats. So we're going to have a great discussion and viewing Saturday night. Moving chronologically into the 90s, The Truman Show with Jim Carrey, maybe his best film, about a guy that wakes up one day and realizes his whole life is a physical construct. It's not real. Twilight Zone may be one of my favorite episodes from the first season, A World of Difference, in which a businessman goes to make a phone call in his office. He hears somebody yell, cut, and he looks around, and all of a sudden, his life is a movie set. Now, I know we've all been there, right? With or without <laughs> substances, if you know what I mean. But yes, a world of difference. Richard Matheson's greatest episode, in my opinion. 1999, M. Night Shyamalan. Shima, you, you know what I'm talking about. This is probably still his best film. I mean... Have you seen any other of his films? You know what I'm talking about. And what's it about? I can see dead people. You don't know until the end, spoiler alert, Bruce Willis has been dead the whole time. Well, don't get me started on how much I love the great Inger Stevens. You know, she was one of the greatest beauties of the 60s. It's said that she bedded down every leading man in Hollywood. But I'm serious, you know why? because she was having an interracial romance with a black man that in those days they could not make public, especially in Hollywood. And in 1969, after keeping it secret all through the 60s, and that's why she betted that everybody wanted to get with Inger Stevens. In 1970, he went back to his wife and she committed suicide or overdosed on sleeping pills. But this episode, in many ways, is so bittersweet because it's about a woman who doesn't realize she's been dead the whole time, driving cross country. And Inger Stevens is just immortal in this episode. There's the 1962 episode Shadow Play with Dennis Weaver, remember, from Duel? He plays a man condemned to die on the, at the electric chair, except he thinks he's having a recurring nightmare where every night he wakes up just when they pull the switch. But nobody, of course, believes him. They think he's nuts. Well, at the end of the episode, you realize what is reality. Is it a dream we're having? This is something philosophers and wise men 
and literary geniuses have been debating for literally thousands of years. But look at how this episode affected the premises of The Matrix in 1999. David Lynch's masterpiece, Mulholland Drive, recently voted the greatest movie of the 21st century, which I've been saying ever since it debuted in 2001. And it's basically the premise of shadow play that Lynch, I believe, used to make Mulholland Drive the masterpiece it is. Christopher Nolan's Inception plays around with the nature of dreams and reality. And I know the movie Bomb, but does anybody see Cameron Crowe's Vanilla Sky 2001? It had a similar concept about the nature of reality and dreams and fantasy. Well, somehow, Cruz, using his star power, was able to get Times Square closed off. This is not a special effects, folks. He got Times Square shut down so they could shoot the opening scenes where he's in a deserted Times Square. But what's that up on the Jumbotron? Ah, Cameron Crowe paid homage to shadow play because it's the basic premise of Vanilla Sky. So those are the movies the Twilight Zone has influenced, which is the tip of the iceberg. But what about television, you might ask? Now, I'm not talking about the crappy remakes that were done in the 80s that were all shot in color. And sorry, Twilight Zone fans of these POSs. I watched them all. I gave them a chance. They all suck because they don't get filmed in black and white like the original. So let's talk about the television influence of The Twilight Zone. First and foremost, the fondly remembered one-hour show Outer Limits on ABC from 1963 to 65. Okay, I grew up with The Outer Limits. It's got the greatest opening in a We Are in Control of your television set. But even that opening couldn't have been possible without the Twilight Zone openings. But to all you Outer Limits fans that think the Outer Limits was better than the Twilight Zone, I'll meet you outside, okay, after. With the bodyguards I hired to beat you up. Okay, but let's talk about its influence on Star Trek in the mid-60s. Even the logos look similar. But check out the original press release for the first Star Trek episode. What does it say in the first line? Twilight Zone type science fiction. You know, creator Gene Roddenberry delivered the eulogy at Rod Serling's funeral in 1975. He died at the age of 50, yeah, from smoking all those cigarettes. Kids, don't smoke tobacco. Don't smoke tobacco. <laughs> and you adults too, same thing. Anyway, he basically said in his eulogy that Star Trek would have been a glimmer in his eye had it not been for the trails that were blazed by Serling with the Twilight Zone, especially with the diversity of casting. Serling cast black women, black men in dramatic roles, single independent women in dramatic roles when the only women on TV were screwbill comedians like Lucille Ball or domestic housewives like Donna Reed. So in the 80s, remember the TV show V about benevolent aliens that come, but of course they're not benevolent? And then it was remade about 10 years ago for two seasons on ABC with Monica Baccarin. I don't know if you saw it. I thought it was pretty good. But where does this premise come from? Yeah, the Twilight Zone, the Canimates. Remember the episode? They're aliens that come like geek, I was going to say Greeks bearing, but it's really geeks bearing gifts. That's my pun. But somehow, and I never understood this, they decide to leave behind their book at the UN halfway through the episode. And they can only decipher the title, To Serve Man. But we all know what To Serve Man was. It's a cookbook. Now, people love this episode. It's not even in my top 50. You know why? It's a punchline episode. I get it. To Serve Man is a pun. But man, in polls amongst fans, this episode ranks right up there. So in the 90s, we had the creation of the X-Files. Are you kidding me? Chris Carter, he worships at the throne of Rod Serling. How about in the 2000s, the genre-bending lost about a bunch of people that are, that are a, a shipwrecked, a plane wreck on a desert island, and they can't get off, and they don't know how they, whatever. And we learn all about them. Well, you think there's a Twilight Zone connection? It's not Twilight Zone, but Serling had a one-year series on ABC in 1969 
about a group of young people that get shipwrecked, a plane wrecked on a desert island, and that was called The New People, and it only ran for one season. But now in this century, how about Mad Men? Matthew Weiner, who created Sopranos, created Mad Men, and he talks about the impact of Surly in the Twilight Zone all the time. The great episodes that we're going to watch tonight, like Willoughby, about the Madison Avenue Mad Men who couldn't take the rat race, couldn't take the pressure. The great actor Gig Young, in maybe the single greatest time travel episode, if not the greatest single episode of The Twilight Zone, um, called Walking Distance, where a harried ad exec literally walks back in time and meets himself as a child. I'm trying to get this water bottle open. Here we go. How about Westworld? Did anybody see the Westworld series on HBO, right? It ran for four or five seasons. I thought it was excellent. It was based on a 1973 movie with Yul Brynner about hosts, as they're called, who entertain rich people who come. And of course, things go awry, like in most science fiction films. So where do we get that from in the Twilight Zone? The very first episode to be filmed in 1959 and aired as the sixth episode called The Lonely. And it's all about a female robot that's sent to a prisoner, sent to solitary on a desert planet. That's his solitary in the future. And we all fall in love. She's the actress Jean Marsh from Upstairs, Downstairs, if you remember that. That was like the first British series to have an impact in American culture, I think, in the 70s. Now, I'm not saying Serling created female robots. I mean, they were part of science fiction literature for decades before Serling. But what Serling did, his major achievement with The Twilight Zone, was bringing serious science fiction, meaning science fiction literature, which the American literati critics looked down upon. That's why all the movies in the 50s were not based on literature but they were giant ants, right? And, and, you know, there was one decent movie, maybe Forbidden Planet and War of the Worlds, but everything else was Drek. Serling adapted serious science fiction and brought it to, to television. There's another great Ingrid Stevens episode where she plays, she doesn't realize it, but she is also a, a robot. Now, how about the movie Get Out? A couple of years ago, 2017, written and directed by the former comedian Jordan Peele. Look at how it was promoted here. Well, because of the success of that film, CBS gave him the reins to do a new Twilight Zone on their streaming service. It was two one-hour seasons of 10 episodes each in 2019 and 2020. Did anybody watch them? Yeah, they sucked. Okay, and they were shot in color too. But yeah, they sucked. He ends up doing a movie a couple of years ago, his second film called Us, uh, which is all about people seeing duplicates of themselves. Well, <laughs> only one of the greatest Twilight Zone episodes of all time, Mirror Image with Vera Miles. You might recognize her as the sister on Psycho. Basically, the whole concept of seeing duplicates of ourselves. The only TV show in the 21st century that I feel even can be talked about as being worthy of the mantle of a new Twilight Zone. Has anybody seen the English series Black Mirror? It streams. If you haven't seen it, the reason why this measures up, it's all about technology in the 21st century that goes awry in all different facets. And what makes this equal, well, not equal to the Twilight Zone, but able to be spoken of in the same breath like I'm doing right now, is that it comes from a, ye a unique sensibility. Charlie Brooker either writes all the episodes or he show runs the whole thing. And just like Twilight Zone, there's a bunch of clunkers, but there's also a couple of great episodes of Black Mirror, so try and seek that out. But the Twilight Zone's been done in play form. There are radio dramas you can get. There's podcasts. When you see a sign like this, the Comedy Zone, you know it's going to talk about the Twilight Zone. And then, of course, there are the books that have been written. The very first book in 1982, I actually tried to be the art director of, but Bantam sent my proposal back and said, we're going to do the book in-house. 
but it's the first book about a TV show after the making of Star Trek. And now, of course, you go into a bookstore and there's a whole TV section. But in 1982, there were two books about TV. There have been the collected stories of the Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone and its impact in philosophy, the greatest episodes, are 25-minute exegeses, if I'm using that word correctly, into the nature of the great philosophical questions of life, which brings us to this book, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in the Twilight Zone, based on, you know, that book about, what, 25 years ago, Everything I Need to Know I Learned in Kindergarten. But we're going to be featuring Mark DeVigiac um, on Saturday night. He's the expert in Mark Twain and Ambrose Spears, so we'll, know, we'll find out more about this book. And there's the definitive biography of Serling, done by Nick Parisi, who will be my guest tomorrow night, talking about Serling's early years and living in Westport. So out of all the books about the Twilight Zone in the last 42 years, there's only one book. That's a coffee table art book about the show. It's my book. And when you take off the dust jacket, you can see I emboss the eyeball in outer space which I was four and a half years old. It's the first visual image I can recall seeing in my life. And then 30 years later, I end up doing a coffee table art book with the eyeball from outer space, which is one of the great surrealist images of all time. Now, in this book, I try and... Let me just put this down. I try and compare the interior photography of the show to black and white art photography, to the graphics that are like surrealist graphics. I take images from one episode, compare it to images from another, and then I take dialogue and narration, which you're gonna hear during our break on the soundtrack, and transcribe it, typeset it to read like poetry. So we have two faces, one that we wear and the other that we keep hidden is from one episode and the two images from another. When everyone is beautiful, no one will be, because without ugliness, there can be no beauty. That's from one episode, and you can see the two images I show with that. And then some of my own writing, equivalent to what I'm talking to right now, along with images like Grant Wood's American Gothic, I call Serling's Twilight Zone a psycho-American Gothic. And then, of course, there's my new book that I'm proud to present Debuting tonight, it's a week ahead of its publication date of October 2nd, which is the Twilight Zone's exact 65th anniversary, and it's also Serling's centennial this year. So maybe that's why the Westport Library let me do this. I, you know, I don't know. But anyway, the five themes, there's a whole story behind how I came up with five themes, but that's what the book's about. I break down what I believe are the greatest episodes, and I write essays about them, science and superstition, Suburban Nightmares, A Question of Identity, The Time Element, An Obsolete Man. In my opinion, these are the five themes that Serling's greatest episodes and the other writers kind of wrote up to without maybe even realizing it. So in Obsolete Man, I list all the episodes that fit that theme. So when you go to Eye the Beholder, the great pig-faced episode, I know if I ruin the ending for somebody out there, but everybody's seen it. We'll be screening that on Sunday afternoon. Now, you can see how in my essay, like the rest of the book, I also include images from the show, outtakes, images of Serling that were used as publicity photos. And then what I do as a graphic designer, I ghost behind the type of my essay a grade back image that suggests the episode without obscuring the legibility of the type, which is what I learned at Rodan School Design. Thank you, Rizvi. And then I compare it to other images from the time. And everything I do about the Twilight Zone, I dedicate to Rod Serling as one, not just one of the greatest television writers of all time, but one of the greatest American writers of the 20th century. So when I knew that my book was coming out this fall, Many months ago, I met with Bill Harmer and Alex Giannini, and I pitched them the idea of a five-night symposium to go with my five themes called Westport in the Twilight Zone. And that's why we're here tonight and hopefully the next four days. 
from Thursday to Sunday. Now, the first thing many of you might even be asking is, what does the Westport have to do with the Twilight Zone? Well, this is the phone book listing from 1955. And what do we see there right in the middle? Rod Serling moved here from Cincinnati in the mid-50s with his wife and two kids. They lived on Hill Point Road. This is a shot of the house that's presently there now. And maybe it reminded Serling of growing up in the town of Binghamton. He was born in Syracuse, but they moved right away to Binghamton. Now, this is young Rod with his mother and father, Jewish. The father was an inventor, but during the Depression, he had to become a butcher to make money. His, though his mother was just a, quote, housewife, but she raised not one writer, but two writers. His older brother, Rod, um, oh, his older brother's name, Jesus, oh, Robert Serling, also became a writer, writing about aviation, of all things, but I got to give, you know, Mrs. Serling credit for raising two writers. And Serling from the start was precocious. He was supposedly witty and brilliant. And when the war broke out, he's born in 1924, so he's 18, and he enlists in the war. And he gets put in the Pacific fleet as a paratrooper. And when you look at these images of him during the war, it might look like he was having a grand time with his war buddies. But of course, like most people that entered the war, that was not to be. There's a great graphic novel by Brooklynite Corin Shadme. Came out 2019 called Twilight Man. And it mostly is about Serling's war experiences in graphic novel form. And suffice it to say, like his entire generation... Serling was scarred by what he witnessed and took part in in the Pacific Theater. But maybe the worst indignity of all was after the war, while he was still in Europe in 46, his father dies of a heart attack at the age of 53, and they don't let Serling go back for the funeral. Now, for a Jewish man not to bury his father is such a sin but this shows you the possible anti-Semitism that existed in World War II on the American side that many Jewish soldiers still don't even speak about. But Serling, like the generation of Americans that came back from the war and cathartically put their war experiences into their art, Norman Mailer, Bud Schulberg, Jack Kirby from Marvel Comics, uh, served with Patton. Serling wrote two Twilight Zone episodes that dealt with his war experiences. The first one in 1960, and yeah, that's Dick York from Bewitched on the right, was called The Purple Testament about a soldier who could see the look of death in his fellow soldier's eyes, which is probably something Serling actually experienced. And then two seasons later, that's Dean Stockwell, made up in what they called oriental makeup to look Japanese because the episode starts out where he's an American lieutenant, but in order to see the war from the enemy's eyes, which was Serling's idea, he has Dean Stockwell halfway through the episode become a Japanese lieutenant, and it's called the quality of mercy. Serling so honored his war service that he was buried as a soldier, and yet, he always said he wanted to be remembered as a writer. So he comes back from the war, gets the GI Bill, goes to Antioch, switches to dramatic writing, meets his wife, Carolyn, there. She's a Unitarian, and he's Jewish, but he likes the Unitarian idea. They're an old sect of Christianity that doesn't believe in Jesus' divinity, but still believes in the one God. And that's why Serling loved to celebrate Christmas like a lot of American Jews who suffer what I call Christmas envy, Serling loved Christmas for the fact that it was more of a secular American holiday, kind of like Thanksgiving. So he becomes a writer. He starts writing for radio, which is where he starts with his practice that would carry him through the rest of his career, um, dictating his scripts into a tape recorder. And that's why some of his lesser scripts are very wordy. But look, he wins a $1,000 contest for television writing. In the early 50s, he was the right man at the right 
time when radio was transitioning into this new medium of television. And he tried to do it from Cincinnati, commuting to New York, where all of live television was being filmed. But then he realized he would have to move to New York City in the mid-50s to take advantage. But he was a small-town kid from Binghamton, and he even said moving to Westport was, in his own words, a concession to my own particular hesitancy about all things big, massive, and imposing. New York TV and people were such an entity. But maybe Westport in the mid-50s, this being the corner of Main Street, appealed to Serling because it probably reminded him a lot of what Binghamton was like, what most smaller North American cities were like uh, before and after World War II. Of course, Westport had its train station where Serling would commute in on the Westport stop to the live television world where he was known as a television playwright where everything was shot live back then and very prestigious programs you've heard of like Playhouse 90 and the U.S. Steel Hour. Well, in 1955, his script for a show called Patterns aired. It was live, and it was all about Richard Kiley and Ed Begley as an aging businessman, and Richard Kiley is the new kid on the block that's usurping him, and that's Everett Sloan from Citizen Kane as the boss. And this is one of Serling's recurring themes about the aging protagonist who has to deal with a changing world. That won an Emmy, his first Emmy. It was the first live TV show to be not, re they didn't tape them in those days. So they wanted to rerun it, but they had to show it again live. It was the first program of its kind. The great Jack Palance in 1956's Requiem for a Heavyweight, also about an aging protagonist, a boxer this time. Serling boxed. He was a bantamweight in the Pacific Theater, so that's where he drew upon. This won him his second Emmy. Serling was a great adapter of short stories. If you haven't seen Mickey Rooney in The Comedian, which was adapted from an Ernest Lehman short story. Ernest Lehman, gee, he only wrote Sound of Music, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, and a couple of other masterpieces. But Serling, some of his greatest Twilight episodes are adaptations. And to adapt a prose story into a half-hour TV show is an art form. That's why they honor it at the Oscars. And that won Serling his third Emmy. And here he's saying to his fellow writers and producers, let's go for a fourth. Well, the clout that winning three Emmys in a row while he's here in Westport made him famous overnight and brought various commercial endorsements out of him. And remember, he was struggling after the war to make a living as a writer. So when money and success with the three Emmys came to him, he helped start here in Westport the famous writer's school. Look on the back of the mail-in card. You can see Serling's name in the third column there at the bottom. But the clout that the three Emmys gave him let him go out to Twilight Zone in 1958 to do the Twilight Zone. And it was in the Twilight Zone that Serling was able to tell stories about America, about us, about places like Westport and Saugatuck that with his science fiction eye saw as earth creatures in their native habitat, like Maple Street. Now, Westport has Maple Avenue, but one of Serling's greatest episodes that I feel might have been influenced by his time in Westport in the mid-50s. It's about a gang of neighbors when all of a sudden the electricity shuts off. The cars don't work. And it turns nighttime and they start suspecting each other of being an alien from outer space. Because remember, folks, this is the late 50s when UFOs were still all the rage. And one by one, it becomes a kind of like a Night of the Living Dead where they literally eat each other alive. And some incredible graphic close-ups that really make the Twilight Zone unique. It was shot for television. Of course, we get to the end of the episode, and it's aliens that are manipulating the electricity to make Earth people basically kill each other. And the leader says, so there are many Maple Streets like this on Earth? 
and the other alien goes, yeah, and we'll go from one to the other and let them destroy themselves. One to the other. One to the other. One to the other. You get the idea. That's actually how it fades out. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. And yes, that episode was called The Monsters Are Doing Maple Street. Now, this was Serling writing from the McCarthy era in the mid-50s when neighbor turned on neighbor. And that was one of the great kind of um, motifs that everybody had to live with back then, as well as the threat of the atomic bomb dropping on everybody's head. So Serling in 1962, the beginning of the Twilight Zone's third season, does an episode called The Shelter, all about how they hear the bomb alert on the radio, and only one neighbor amongst a bunch of, again, could have been Westport neighbors of Serling, who all kind of loved each other at the beginning of the episode, turns out only one of them has a bomb shelter. So the others become a mob. And at one point in the episode, Serling has this character on the left named Marty Weiss. And the guy on the right is Frank Henderson, who accuses Weiss, let me get my notes here, of being a, quote, foreigner. Remember, Serling couldn't use the word Jew, but he named him Marty Weiss. And listen to what Henderson says. This was dialogue that could have been written yesterday. That's the way it is when the foreigners come over here. Pushy, grabby, semi-Americans. Now, in the mid-50s, there was the film Gentleman's Agreement about anti-Semitism in the American culture. So again, these were currents that Serling took and put into these Twilight Zone episodes that could have been formed by what he witnessed in three years in Westport in the mid-50s. In King's Dance Macabre, he said about this episode, rarely has any television program dared to present human nature in such an ugly, revealing light. And if this scene doesn't remind you of the timeliness, the prescience of this episode, it should remind you of January 6, 2021. Now, there's even other Westport connections that are more tangential. A 1964 episode with Robert Lansing as an astronaut who goes into suspended animation for the woman that he loves, played by Marietta Hartley. Now, you might remember her from a great Star Trek episode in the third season, or from the decade she did those Polaroid commercials with James Garner. She grew up in Weston. And she met Serling. She invited him to speak to her high school class. And then when she went out to Hollywood 10 years later, she met up with Serling, who remembered her and wrote this episode for her. And then there's the one-hour episode from the Twilight Zone's fourth season. They tried one hours. The best one is on Thursday, We Leave for Home with the great American actor James Whitmore as the leader of a group of stranded space colonists who have been on this desert planet for 40 years. But Whitmore keeps them together, and the way he keeps their spirits up is by reminding them of the earth that he remembers when he was a kid 40 years ago. In my coffee table book, again, I compare some interior photography of when the bomb dropped with one of the surrealist Twilight Zone graphics and I typeset Serling's dialogue that Whitmore recites and treat it like poetry. I remember the earth. I remember it as a place of color. I remember that in the autumn, the leaves changed, turned different colors, red, orange, gold. And I remember, right, and the water, I remember streams of water that flowed down hillsides and the water was sparkling and clear. I remember clouds in the sky, white billowy things floated like ships, like sails. And I remember night skies like endless black velvet. Night was a quiet time when the earth went to sleep, kind of like a cover that had pulled over itself. It was a darkness that felt like a cool hand just brushed past tired eyes. And there was snow on the winter nights, gossamer stuff, and it floated down and covered the earth, made it all white and cool. And it was good then, it was right. I believe this was Serling having fond memories of either growing up in Binghamton 
or maybe the couple of years he spent in bucolic Westport. But the most Westporty episode takes place actually in Westport at that train station. Remember this image about the harried mad, uh, Madison Avenue ad exec? He can't take the business with his boss telling him it's a push business, a push, push, push business, push and drive all the time, right on down the line. And once again, Serling is writing at the time that the man in the gray flannel suit, super popular novel published in 1955, just when Serling moves to Westport. A year later, it's made into a even more popular movie with the great Gregory Peck. But again, these are the currents analyzing the post-war American businessman in society. So Serling has his doppelganger named Gart Williams on the train commuting from Westport. You can hear the conductor yell out the stops, Westport, Saugatuck. So that's basically Serling the doppelganger. He drifts off to sleep. And then he wakes up, and he doesn't know if he's in a dream or reality, but he looks out the window, and he sees this. And I'm not going to explain too much, because we're going to screen this episode, but why are we pairing this episode with the 1968 film, The Swimmer? I don't know how many of you have seen it. It's been on TV over the years. It had a very odd ad campaign. I mean, what do you make of this? When you talk about the swimmer, will you talk about yourself? I don't know. You can figure that out. But it was based on a short story by the great John Cheever that was published in 1964 in the New Yorker, July 18th. So this is the 60th anniversary of what many consider Cheever's short story. Now, this past summer, there was an art show at the Flag Art Foundation in New York City that was based on The Swimmer. A masterpiece of fiction inspires the urge to submerge in a gallery crawl. And I'm like, wow, an art show about The Swimmer. And I went to it, and it was pretty wild. You can see this was what some of the space looked like. There were conceptual kind of water projects paintings of swimmers, photographs that look like David Hockney's work, if you know David Hockney. These sort of resemble the original New Yorker photo illustration the most. So seeing this art show made me want to reread. I hadn't read The Swimmers since I was in college, I think. But nowadays, you can find it online, so I got to reread it. And then I wanted to watch the movie again. Well, I had an old DVD that was sort of like a no-name DVD without any extras. Maybe I've had this for 15 years. But recently, actually it came out 10 years ago, but I wasn't aware of it. I saw a YouTube reviewer reviewing a Grindhouse Records Blu-ray DVD with all the extras you would expect in a Blu-ray DVD. Now, if we look at the reviews that they posted, grim, disturbing, and sometimes funny, the film has the shape of an open-ended hallucination, the great Vincent Canby. Burt Lancaster is superb in his finest performance, four stars, the great Roger Ebert. Totally engrossing, thanks to its very strangeness and to the superb performances and vivid location photography, five stars. But look at the promo copy. Based on the acclaimed short story by John Cheever, screenplay, blah, 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 The Swimmer is a film like no other, a feature-length Twilight Zone episode by way of The New Yorker. Now, revenge is a dish best served cold, but vindication is oh so sweet. If you know what I mean by vindication. I remember seeing The Swimmer when I was a kid on TV in the early 70s. I was a teenager. And I loved The Twilight Zone since I grew up on it. And the minute I saw it, I was like, that's like a Twilight Zone episode. So if what they're saying is true... If The Swimmer, the movie, is like a Twilight Zone episode, and by implication, so is the short story then by John Cheever about a man who swims across Fairfield County by swimming in neighbor's swimming pools. Uh, hello? Twilight Zone. So what episode would that be? Yes, it's a stop at Willoughby. And we are right on time. I love it. Here we go, ladies and gentlemen, a stop at Willoughby. Willoughby.